Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a series of messages on the subject of God's spiritual work in your life. And we've talked about many different things. We've talked about spiritual birth. We've talked about receiving the Holy Spirit. We've talked about getting your prayer language and praying in tongues. We talked about continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about God's Word, the spiritual law, how we need to put it first place in our life, and how we need to get the spiritual mind of Christ established in us as we are being renewed to the Word of God. We also talked about the building of our spiritual house and how you are to become the spiritual house of God that He can operate in and flow through. We talked about our spiritual inheritance, the blessings, the promises that He wants to bring forth. We've also talked about the spiritual authority that we have in the kingdom and how we have spiritual weapons and we engage in spiritual warfare, spiritual fight against a spiritual enemy, and we conquer them by the power and authority of Jesus Christ. We also talked about the spiritual cleansing that is to come forth in our life, that we would be holy before the Lord so He can accomplish the things that He purposes. Today we're going to begin to talk about spiritual fruitfulness. Spiritual fruitfulness must come forth in your life. We see in Mark chapter 4, in verse 14, the sower soweth the word. The parable of the sower, which we're going to be talking about today, brings a revelation and understanding of how God's Word produces fruitfulness because fruitfulness comes from God and the way it happens is through the Word of God in you. Also, as we look at this, you're going to see an understanding of the spiritual warfare that comes against the Word in you because the devil comes to take that Word out or to stop it from producing fruit or to choke it out in some manner. The Word in you is the key. If the Word is not in you, there's no fruit. If the word is in you and you're continuing in it, you will bring forth fruit, you will bring forth more fruit, and you will bring forth much fruit. And that is what he purposes for all of us. We see in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, the sower soweth the word. The subject of this parable is the word of God. It's not the ground, it's the word of God. Because we see how it gets sown in all these different types of ground uh, when you look at the parable prior to this where it talks about this. We see over in Luke's account, so we'll be looking at the three accounts in Mark 4, Luke 8, and Matthew 13. In Luke's account, in chapter 8, verse 11, the parable's this, the seed is the word of God. So the sower sows the word, and the word is like seed being sown in you. Seed is necessary for the plant to grow up and bring forth a harvest of fruit. The Word is necessary in your life if you are going to have fruitfulness and see God accomplish the things that He purposes. So the seed is the Word of God. This is why you need to be hearing the Word, studying the Word, seeing the Word, getting the Word in you. It is absolutely imperative. As you get the Word coming to you, it is coming into your heart and it is coming into your mind. We see in Proverbs 4, verse 21, and back up to verse 20, it says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, you're to keep them before you. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. They get into your heart when you hear them. Their life unto those that find them, and their health to all your flesh. God's word will produce that. You're to keep or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues or the outgoings, this means of life. God wants you to get the Word in you. It is absolutely imperative if you are going to see God accomplish the things that He purposes. And remember, in the New Testament, over in Hebrews, chapter 8, talking about the covenant that we have now in the New Testament, Hebrews 8.10 says, This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, speaking of the New Testament era, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. 
in Hebrews 10, 16, it says the opposite of that. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. The word gets written and put in your heart, and it gets written and put in your mind. In your mind, it produces hope. In your heart, it produces faith. But the key is the word in your heart. That is what the enemy is after. He wants to try to get it out of your heart. Of course, the word in you is how you got to the place of being born again. Somebody had to sow the word of God in you. In fact, we see in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, how? Not of corruptible seed, but of by, incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God's word, when it gets sown in you, it's alive and it begins to work in you. And what did it do? It produced the new birth as you believed the word, you believed the gospel, and you acted upon it by receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and being born again. Now, it is absolutely of a necessity that you have spiritual fruitfulness in your life. We know this as we will take a look at John first before we go through the parable of the sower. John chapter 15, verse 1 says, I'm the true vine, my father is the husbandman or the pruner. Every branch in me, that would be someone who's in Jesus Christ, who's born again, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That means just because you're born again doesn't mean that you couldn't be taken away. If you don't bear fruit, you're going to be taken away. You're going to be eliminated. Every branch that beareth fruit, which you're expected to bring, he purgeth it, means he cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That means that unless you go through the cleansing process, you'll never get to the place of bringing forth more fruit in your life. Many Christians have never got to that place because they haven't gone through the cleansing process, dealing with all the sin areas, dealing with getting rid of the filthiness of the flesh, casting out the evil spirits to get cleansed of all that is not of the Lord. He says, now you are clean, the King James says, through the word which I've spoken unto you, but it's not a good translation. The word through is the word dia in the Greek. When dia is used with a genitive case following that, is what it's what modifying, it is translated through. When it has an accusative case modifying, it is, means because of. This is the word dia in the Greek, and SCM, which is, if you see below here, that is the scrivener's translation of the Greek, which is the basis for the King James. Following it, you see this is an accusative, that's a definite article, and then the word for word is accusative. The reason I point this out to you is why it's not translated through. It's translated because of the word. That's different. If it was just through the word that I've spoken, if the word was spoken to all of us, does that mean we're automatically clean? No, that's not what it's saying. It says, because of the word. That means because of the word that's come into you, meaning you must be doing something with it once it's come into you. And that's the implication of it. You are clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you. Now, this is important also to understand what's being said. Just because of the word that's been spoken unto you, implying that you must be doing something with it, this also implies it because the word spoken is in a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek is important. It expresses things that have been accomplished in the past, completed action in the past, with present results at the time of speaking. In other words, it's talking about the word that came to you in the past, and you have the present results of it now, implying you took hold of it, you've been doing it, you've been walking in it, you've seen this is your lifestyle, you've been carrying it out in your life. Essentially, you've been a hearer and a doer of what you have heard in the past, evidenced by the present results. That is what this is saying. Again, how does the fruitfulness come? Through the Word. And how does the cleansing come? Because of the Word that you act on to get cleansed of all the evil. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you can't bear fruit of yourself. God's the one who accomplishes it. Except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. 
And he goes on to verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. We've come from the fruit, going through the cleansing, fruit, cleansing stage to more fruit, and now come to the abiding, remaining, continuing stage. That's the way you bring forth much fruit. And that is what God wants. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch. That tells you that you could not necessarily always abide in him. You could choose not to. You could choose to turn away from him. The reason why it says this is because this is a conditional statement, subjunctive mood. A con much subjunctive mood in the Greek is a conditional statement. That's why Young's translate, right, translates it, if anyone may, or more accurately might, because it's aorist tense, might not remain in me. That means they, don't, they, they, they can remain in him or they might not remain in him. It depends on the choices that they make. If you don't remain in him, you're cast forth as a branch and withered. Men gather them and cast them in the fire and they're burned. Oh, that, that guy's not saved at all. We need to continue in him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's the key. You shall ask, this means I tell you, make a demand of what you will, and it shall be done unto you as you pray to see the promises come to pass. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. God wants you to be a disciple, and he wants you to bring forth much fruit. Spiritual fruitfulness is to come forth in your life. Now, going back to the parable of the sower, as we examine this, we'll be looking in these three different places, Mark 4, Mark, Mark, Matthew 13, and Luke 8, 12. We see in Mark 4, we come to verse 15. This is the seed sown by the wayside. The four different types of ground are a type of the word sown in the heart. It says, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. That shows you that when the word comes into you, the devil is after the word that's come into your heart. He wants to get it out of your heart so that it will not produce fruit. How could he get it out of your heart if you don't do it? Now, that necessitates something else. We go over to Matthew 13. Verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, he hasn't gained the understanding of it. Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart. That shows you that if you don't understand the word and do what the word says, he'll be able to take it out of your heart. Otherwise, you need revelation and the Holy Spirit will bring revelation of the Word, and then you are to do the Word and walk in it. And this understanding here is not like I understood it for a moment. The reason is because it's a present tense verb. You gained understanding on an ongoing basis. How would I get understanding on an ongoing basis? Because I continually do the Word, and that's how you come to understand. He that doeth truth comes to the light. And that's how you come to the place of having spiritual understanding, because you're a doer of the word. So this implies someone who's received the word here, and he's doing the word. He's come to some spiritual understanding. If not, the devil will take it out of your heart. And why is the devil after this? Luke's account shows this. So you have to look at them all together to see what all's being said. Luke 8, 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The devil does not want you to believe that word. And if you believe it, you're going to act upon it. You're going to do what it says. And be saved, which will be the result. This is the word sozo, which will produce salvation, produce healing, produce deliverance, produce victory, peace. And all these promises in our life is what this is speaking of. So this tells us the first thing. You need to hear the word, you need to be doing the word so you gain spiritual understanding and walking in it consistently in your life. We come to the next one as we go back to Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, we pick up in verse 16. 
These are they likewise which are stone on, sown on the stony ground, the second type. Now remember the ground is a type of the heart. Who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. The word receive is the word lambano. And you've heard us talk about this many times in the past. It means to take hold of, a self-prompted taking hold of it. Otherwise, they heard the word, they took hold of it. They took hold of it to apply it in their life, and they did it with gladness. That's important. They didn't do it because they have to do it or ought to do it. They did it with gladness. If you don't have a right, willing attitude, you're not going to get anywhere. Those that are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land. Those that do things out of duty or obligation or think because I should do it, they're not, they're not doing things right. You're going to receive it with gladness and joy as you receive the Word of God. Now, in Luke's account, it says something a little different because of the Greek word used. Here he says, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the Word with joy. This is the word decamai, if you see me put the cursor over it and, and below in the lower window, decamai. Decamai is a different word. It means a passive reception where you accept something that comes to you. In Vine's expository dictionary in New Testament words, he brings out good information about this comparing decamai and lambano. Decamai is a passive reception while lambano is an active taking hold of an active reception. So what this is telling you is the proper way for you to receive the word is you have to have a ready reception, ready to receive what's coming to you, and then take hold of it to apply it in your life. Otherwise, we don't play pick and choose. I like that, but I don't like that. You know, no, you need to be ready to receive all the word that's coming to you, and you're also then expected to take hold of it and apply it in your life. Now, as we go back over to Mark chapter 4 again, where we see this. They said they received it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. It hasn't been rooted and established. The root system gives you the stability. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. The word affliction is the word thlipsis in the Greek, which means pressure. The devil brings pressure against you, trying to get you to not either believe the word, receive the word, act on the word, do the word, do something else, anything to try to press you against doing what God wants. Or persecution. Persecution is what puts you to flight to get you to just to leave the word and, and move away from it and go some other direction. Persecution will come. Persecution is trying to get you to give up and throw in the towel and stop doing it, essentially. The pressure, they're all working. Pressure is usually coming from the inside, and persecution, your attacks that a lot of times from the outside are just trying to get you to give up and throw in the towel and move away from it. Why are they coming? They're coming for the word's sake. They're not coming for you. You say, boy, the devil's after me. No, in reality, he's after the word in you. He's not, but if you don't have the word in you, does he bother you? No. So is he really after you? No. But when you start hearing the word, then what? Ah, the attacks start coming, don't they? Well, I thought everything was supposed to be great when I started hearing the word. You've got to understand the spiritual warfare that's going on. The attack is on. When you start hearing the word or doing it in any aspect of life, whatever it is, the devil will be after the word to try to stop you from hearing and doing it. So, it arises for the word's sake. And what happened? Immediately they're offended. That meant they stumbled and fell. This is the word scandalazo, which means to stumble. Ah, they stumbled and they fell, tripped up and were fallen. That meant they succumbed to the pressure. They succumbed to the attacks of the enemy. You have to be ready to deal with all attacks that the enemy brings against you, trying to get you to not do the word, regardless of what it is, whether it's anything walking in love, operating in faith, casting out the demons, what it might, or it might be, you know, giving out to someone, operating in area, area, ministry, any area of the word, it might be. The devil does not want you to hear and do the word of God. He will come against it, against you in your life. So, this is the de devil attacking you, coming against you. 
We see this affliction speaking of this over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man's renewed day by day by the word. For our light affliction, or the pressure, which is but for a moment, it's coming at you at that moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal. God's word is that which is not seen. It's spiritual law. It's the law of the spirit. Your focus is to be on that which is spiritual law, the things that are not seen. The devil will try to get you off the word and look at the seen realm. You're receiving the word on healing and they want you to look at your circumstances. Receiving the word on prosperity and they want you to look again at your circumstances or the situation that you're dealing with. To get your eyes off the word. All the things that are seen are temporal. They can be changed. But the things that are not seen are eternal. You need to tap into that which is in the unseen realm, which is God's spiritual laws, and put them in operation to see all the temporal things change and to see the promises of God come to pass. In Acts chapter 7, so you've got to be ready for these attacks that come. Acts chapter 7, verse 10, here he's speaking about Joseph, how he was sold into Egypt, but God was with him in verse 9. And notice, he delivered him out of all his afflictions, all of his pressures. And he had lots of attacks that came against him. Ended up in prison, all the different things that happened. Blamed wrongly, of course, accused falsely. Gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Regardless of what comes against you, you cannot back off the word. You cannot throw in the towel. You cannot try to do something else. You need to press through it regardless of what the circumstances are, what is going on in you or against you or whatever. If you discontinue in the things of God, God will deliver you out of them. He will bring you out of them and he will bring forth his blessings. In this case, for him, it was favor and wisdom and made governor over Egypt and accomplished the things that God purposed for him. We need to be ready to deal with any attacks that come against us. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I've, things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. If your eyes are on the word and your eyes are on him. In the world you shall have tribulation. That's right, the pressure will come because you are in this world. But be of good cheer or of good courage, this means. I have conquered and carried off the victory is what the word means of the world. If Jesus conquered and carried off the victory over the world and its attacks that brings the pressure against you from the devil, who is the ruler of this world, then you can do it as well. You've got to be of good courage, though. You can't get full of fear, you can't get anxious, can't get upset, can't get discouraged, can't get down and depressed, can't back off, do all these other things. No. You're going to be of good courage. You're going to fight that fight. You're going to take on the enemy. You're going to conquer the pressure that comes against you. You're going to continue in the Word of God so that you're going to see you overcome the attacks that come against you. Now, the pressure that comes against you well, yeah, I can stand a panel pressure for a moment. Well, the truth is, you're going to have a lot of pressure. That's reality. People don't like to have to deal with the pressure. But nonetheless, it'll be there. Look what it says in Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, so the word die, meaning necessary, we must, through much tribulation, not a little bit of tribulation, much pressure enter into the kingdom of God, which is the rule and the reign of God, because you conquer the enemies in your life and you possess the promises. Therefore, you're going to go through much pressure. The devil will attack the word constantly coming against you. You will conquer him and overcome him by doing what the word says, not succumbing to the pressure God will deliver you out of all the pressures, but you will have much pressure. And as you conquer and overcome, you will enter into the kingdom, which is ruling and reigning over the enemy, and he will be put underfoot. 
and you will come to the place of entering into a spiritual rest and you will have peace. Remember, you, can, you, have, you are to have peace in the midst of the battle as far as peace on the inside, even though the raging can come against you. In me, you have peace wherever your mind is set. Remember, thou keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. At the same time, you can be having all this affliction and pressure coming against you. You cannot succumb to the attacks of the enemy or let it get you off track. The devil wants you to get off your focus from the Word of God. That is his design. You must be ready for whatever comes at you. Now, when we talk about persecution, persecution causes someone to flee from something. Acts 8, 1, Saul was consenting into his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church. Persecution, usually from the outside, causes you to draw back or give in the, throw in the towel. There's persecution that's going to come to the church in these last days. We don't see hardly any in this nation at this point. We're starting to see some. At the same time, in other nations, there's tremendous persecution that goes on. God wants us to be ready to deal with persecution. You are, God will deliver you out of all these things. At the same time, you will have it. It's coming against from the, you have to realize the devil is working through these ones who are vessels of the persecution. But look what it says in Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That tells you it's a who, not a what. It's a person. And then he tells you what the who uses. Shall tribulation, pressure, distress, persecution, another thing, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, anything that he can bring at you. Will that separate us? No. Why is it coming at us? As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Who views us that way? The devil does. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You've got to be ready to deal with the attacks. Nay, no, and all these things, we are more than conquerors. This word actually is a, looks like it would be more than conquerors, like a, like a noun form, but actually it's a verb form. It literally says that we are to be completely victorious, is what this word really means. Present tense, continually. Not that we are something, a noun, it's a verb. We are to be completely victorious continually in our life. That's the verb form, through him that loved us. God wants you to get victory over the attacks that the enemy brings against you. Regardless of whether it's pressure, of afflictions, or something coming, persecution coming against you, look at this tremendous promise here in 2 Timothy 3, verse 11. Paul speaking here, persecutions, afflictions, which came at, this is the sufferings of things, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, every city he was going to, he was having these attacks. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. God will deliver you out of all the attacks. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That means you're going to have attacks. Who's the one who's living godly? He's a hearer and a doer of the word. He's walking in line with the word. It means if you don't have any persecution, you're probably not doing the word. You're probably not godly. The ungodly, they don't have persecutions. But the godly will. You live godly, you will suffer persecution persecution. The devil will try to come against you. You must understand. So you don't get blown away by attacks from the enemy. Acts 9 verse 4. This is when Saul was approached by the Lord through the light that shone from heaven. As we see, a light shined about him from heaven. He fell to the earth, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou of me? How was he persecuting Jesus? By what he was doing to all the believers. These, these people are persecuting the Lord. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Otherwise, anybody that's persecuting you, it's actually they're persecuting Jesus. So don't be moved. The disciple's not above the master. You're going to experience the same things that he experienced. The attacks will be there. But God will deliver you out of them all. 
over in Luke chapter 8. In Luke's account, we saw the one account before about how they stumbled. In Luke's account, they on the rock are they which when they hear, they receive the word with joy. These have no root, which for a while believe. They believe for a while. But in time of temptation, the attack comes. They fall away. The word fall away actually is a word. Aphistemi in the Greek. Histemi means stand. And this means to stand away. Apo is in the Greek uh, prefix. It really means to stand away. So this means that the person chose to stand away on an ongoing basis, meaning he threw in the towel and gave up. In time of temptation, he stood away. He fell away continually. You cannot allow that to happen. But why does it happen to people? It says so here, because they have no root. They have no root system established in them. For a while they believe. Think about it. You plant a tree. It doesn't have a root system established yet. You just put it in the ground. And the winds come and it, may, it's, it could get taken up because it's not established yet. What establishes the root system in you? It's the word that you hear and do consistently. Building your house on a rock so it gets established. If you don't do the word, you'll not get the root system established in you. And that is so important. We must be hearers and doers of the word of God. We see over in Matthew's account when we talk about this. Chapter 7, verse 24. Whosoever, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, he's hearing them. This is the present tense in the Greek, which means continuous, ongoing action. He's continually hearing the word. That's good. And doing them, which is also a present tense. This means the person who hears and does the word. He's applying the word every time he hears it. He just doesn't hear it and then think about it and not do it. No, he's doing it. He's putting it in operation, <clears throat> which is what God expects of us. I will liken him to a wise man, <clears throat> which built his house upon a rock. Anybody that builds their house wants to build it on a, where there's a foundation where it'll stand, where it won't, you know, won't fall apart when any attacks come. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew. That's a type of the devil's attacks against you. And beat upon that house. Notice, it was beating upon it, striking against it. The, that's the devil's attacks, coming after the word in you. It fell not. Why? For it was founded upon a rock. It's interesting, the word founded. It is a word which means to lay the foundation. But what else is to cause you to be established? But also what's important about this is the tense of the verb that's used. It is the pluperfect tense. The pluperfect tense in the Greek is a past tense in the sense that the action has been completed in the past. It has nothing to say about the present like the perfect does, but it's just action has been completed in the past, it's been done. It essentially applies, it's already been accomplished, it's a done deal in the past. And that's exactly what this is talking about. You have already built your house on a rock. You're established. You are stable. How did you get to that place? By consistently hearing and doing the word. If you're not a consistent hearer and doer of the word, you won't be established. You won't be stable. You won't come to the place of having the foundation laid in your life. And then the attacks can come against you and blow you away. Now, the next verse talks about the guy who's heard the word, but he hasn't been doing it. And that's the real key. Matthew 7, 26. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, heareth again, present tense, doeth also, present tense, he shall be likened to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Nobody in their right mind is going to build a house on sand and think it's going to be able to stand when the attacks come. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew, beat upon the house, and this time it says it fell. And great was the fall of it. The word was is interesting. This doesn't mean all of a sudden your house went 
You know, it's all down. The word was is a imperfect tense verb, which is a past tense, but it's like the present tense. The present tense means ongoing action. The imperfect tense means ongoing action in the past. What it means is that it fell, and great was the ongoing continual fall of it at the time of speaking. Otherwise, he's been going downhill for some time, which means if you're not a doer of the word, you are going to be going downhill continually. You've got to turn that around and start doing the Word of God. If you're seeing, hey, I've had a lot of problems here and things are, seem like they're going downhill instead of moving up, moving forward, I'm talking about in the Spirit, well, you've got to start doing what the Word says. As you do the Word, then you will see that you will get your house established on the rock. The foundation will be laid and things will be established. You've got to get the root system established. In fact, in destroying the works of the enemy and seeing God accomplish everything, you've got to get this root system established through hearing and doing the Word. You've got to get the teaching, you've got to be doing it, and get it in operation. Uh, must be 31. Isaiah 37, 31. And the remnant that escaped of the house of Judah, they escaped, shall again take root downward, and bear fruit upward. Notice, how am I going to bring fruit? I got to have root downward first. I got to have the root system established before I can bear the fruit upward. You know that. The natural gives us all the picture of these things from just from planting of crops and so forth and trees. If you don't get the thing established, you'll never see the fruit come forth. And sometimes, in some of the plants, you've got to get established for a while before you see it come forth. Too many people think that, well, I should just hear and do the Word, and oh, I should have all this fruit and promises just falling all over me right away. And that's not what the Word shows. You've got to get established hearing and doing the Word. It will come forth, but many people, they don't have the root system established yet. They really haven't gotten the Word in them to the place where they aren't getting blown away by the attacks of the enemy. And if you don't, then you're going to get blown away and you will see all kinds of problems come. When we see the next ground, which is the thorns, we go back to Mark's account. Mark 4, we saw verse 17 where they got offended. Verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. In every case they heard the word, so the word got in their heart in every single case. What happens? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Notice this. What's cares? This is anxieties. Cares, worries, anxieties. Marimna. The cares, and it's not world, it's actually the age of this age. Anything that's going on in this age of cares, worries, anxieties over things concerns. We cannot have cares, worries, anxieties, or concerns about anything. What does God want us to do? Well, He tells us what to do in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care, anxiety upon Him, for He careth for you. Now that's a different word. I've had people say, well, if I cast all the care on me and he cares for me, it means is he carrying the cares? No, it's not talking about that. Look at the word care here. Marimna, down below. Here's the next word care. This means he cares about you. It's a totally different word, the word mellow. Otherwise, he's going to be there to minister to you, minister to your needs. You cast the care upon the Lord, he's going to be there to minister to you. You need to cast all cares, worries, anxieties upon the Lord about everything. Do not be anxious for anything whatsoever. That is absolutely imperative. We can even see over in Luke chapter 10, verse 41. This is where Jesus spoke to Mary and Martha. He said to Martha, 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 you are careful, anxious, and troubled, troubled in mind about many things. 
You can't let yourself be full of anxiety, care, troubled, upset, overburdened about all these things. You need to cast your cares upon the Lord. You need to be not letting this get a hold of you in your life. In fact, we even see in Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged. Otherwise, it will affect your heart where you believe. With surfeiting, which is a drinking wine to excess, a drunkenness, or, or, uh, and this is a drunkenness intoxication, and cares, marimna, of this life. Otherwise, it puts it all in that uh, category there. It will affect your heart. If the cares or the worries or anxieties come upon you of this bios, life, biotikos, your heart will be overcharged. It will affect you. And the devil will be successful in stopping the word producing fruit in your life. What does God tell us to do? When you have say, what do I do about this situation? I cast it on the Lord, but I mean, I need to do something about it. That's right. You need to pray the word of God and put God in operation to bring forth his promise. Look what it says in Philippians 4, 6. Be careful, marimnao, form of that word. Be anxious, troubled, full of care, concerns, worries for nothing. Now, some people say, well, I'm not going to be full of anxiety and worry and care, but I am concerned. It's the same thing. You just kind of watered it down in your own thoughts. No concerns, no worries, no anxieties, no cares about anything. If you're letting things get to you, we're not handling it properly. But in everything, everything means everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, we're going to pray with thanksgiving. What are we doing when we're praying with thanksgiving? We're taking hold of promises, aren't we? We thank him as we take hold of things. Let your request, it's the word aitema, which is a form of aiteo, which means make a demand of what's due you. Be made known unto God. You're going to pray the word of God with thanksgiving. Remember, that's the way we pray the prayer of faith. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, all or, or your mind, goes over your mind, essentially. Because this is the word noose, which means your mind. Shall guard, this word keep means to guard. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That means in the midst of anything coming at you, you can maintain peace. Your heart and mind can be guarded. It all depends on what you're doing. If you're letting anxiety get to you, concerns, worries, cares, that's going to stop you. You take your peace right away. But if you pray the word of God, where's your focus on? It's on God and on the word, taking hold of the promises. Hey, you're going to have peace. Your heart and mind's going to be focused on the promise of God, the answer coming, and you're speaking it into being as you're praying the prayer of faith. Your eyes aren't on that, on the thing, negative thing that's coming against you with the anxiety. This is critical. Many people do not receive things from God because they let the anxiety, cares, concerns, worries, pressure, whatever it is, come to them and stop the word from producing. This is the devil attacking you. Don't think, oh, this is just where well, everybody has these circumstances of life. Yeah, but who's bringing them? The devil is working. You've got to be ready to overcome the attacks that come against you. They'll try to work at your mind. They'll try to work through the senses. They'll try to work in any way to get you off track. If you lose your peace, the devil's got to you. That's one thing you need to remember. Because notice, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. So you should be maintaining peace. If you lose your peace, the devil has got to you. That's something to think about. That means you, hey, I got to get off. If I lose my peace, I, I, I got off track here. I better cast this carol in the Lord. I better get the word, start praying the word, or start doing the word in some aspect. So my focus is on what God's doing and what the promise says and taking hold of it to see it come to pass in my life. So you're operating in the spirit, and the devil will try to get you off of that, get you to look at circumstances, the way it feels, the way it looks, the situation, the way it seems, all that stuff. Anything to get you off of the word, praying the word, and putting the power of God in operation to see God accomplish what he purposes for you. 
So this is going to be important if you're going to overcome every situation. In fact, you also got to be ready to keep your heart, guard your heart. John chapter 14, verse 27, look what it says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. The world's peace is only if the circumstances are good. God's peace is all the time. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Means you got to guard your heart. You got to guard what's coming into your heart. The heart is the inner man, the inward man, the hidden man of the heart on the inside of you. You got to, what's, what's the gates into your heart? What you're thinking? What you're speaking? What you're hearing? What you're seeing? What you're putting your hands to and fellowship with and walking by? So you got to guard yourself from all those things. Do not let your heart be troubled or let it get afraid. That is the devil coming to attack you. That means you have to really get your mind tuned in to the things of the Lord. The battle's in the mind, isn't it? Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The word stayed is a word which means it's, it's like it's leaned up and rested and laid upon. Leaning upon. That means you're really, your mind is leaning upon the Word. It's focused on the Word. You're thinking on the Word. That's, that's where you're at. And notice what it says. Because he trusteth in thee. That means if you really trust in him, your mind's going to be on him, on the Word. If the devil's gotten to your mind, you just moved out of trust. He got you. Took you out of it. You trust the Lord when your mind is stayed on He, which is what? It causes you to maintain hope, remember? And then your faith can bring your hopes into being. Many times, the devil, he works to get you out of hope, get, get this negative stuff in you, get, not get you having your mind stayed on Him. Of course, if your mind is stayed on Him, you'll have peace. If your mind's not stayed on Him, you won't have peace. So anytime you lose peace, Something's happened in your mind, and the devil has got to you. So you know, uh, the devil's made some inroads here. I've got to conquer this so I get my mind back on him and so that I maintain peace. That is important. Which means, of course, it's going to be imperative that you deal with everything that comes at your mind or any of your members. Because that's the gates into your heart, remember. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Casting down imaginations or any kind of reasonings. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Exalting itself means it's raising itself in estimation above the Word of God so you'll look at it instead of the Word. Anything gets your off, eyes off the Word, you're in trouble. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we got three things here. Any reasonings that come to your mind, that's the devil trying to get you to reason in your mind instead of look at the Word, you cast that down. You don't give place to that. Anything that's coming to you, oh, this is a better way to go, or this will work out, instead of the Word exalting itself above the knowledge of God, you cast that down. You exalt, throw that down immediately. Anything that is coming, bringing a thought contrary to the obedience of Christ, you got to bring it captive. Bring into captivity every thought. That means an extremely important thing that you must do on a regular basis, that uh, uh, you've got to get this discipline established, is every thought's got to be taken captive. I mean, if the devil plays with your mind all the time, throwing all this, this stuff, and you don't take the thoughts captive, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And you say, well, what about all the demons that are giving me all these thoughts and all these things? Well, that's not you, that's the demons doing it. Just don't give place to them. Take it captive, think on the good things, don't give place to it whatsoever. Remember, every thought that comes into your mind is not your thought. It can be coming from the demons within you. That's not your thoughts. Some people say, oh, if I have these thoughts, does that mean I'm in trouble? 
Well, that's the devil's thoughts coming at you. You haven't given place to it. That doesn't mean it's in you and you're giving place to it. That's the attack of the enemy against you. So what do you do? You cast it down, bring it in obedience to the bird of Christ, and also you attack those spirits and start casting them out and driving them out to get rid of them out of your mind. Every thought's to be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And also, it's having it in a readiness. This means being prepared and ready. This means you shouldn't be blindsided by any, whatever shows up at you one day. You should be prepared and ready to deal with the attacks. Oh, I wonder why this is all come at me, you know, out of nowhere. I'm getting blindsided like. No, if you're prepared and ready to revenge, which is to avenge the disobedience, what's the disobedience? The devil's reasonings, the devil's trying to exalt above the knowledge of God, the devil's negative thoughts or thoughts contrary to the word that he's bringing into your mind. Don't do this, don't do that, go here, go there. Something contrary to the word of God. Don't cast that anymore, don't do this, you know. Don't be praying the word, blah, blah, blah. Anything it is, he's lying to you. And how are you going to be successful over it? It's when your obedience is fulfilled. Otherwise... You just don't let those thoughts just sit there and not do something about it. You've got to do something about it. Your obedience is going to be fulfilled to bring that thought captive to the obedience of Christ in line with the Word of God. That is absolutely important if you are going to conquer the attacks of the enemy against you. We go back over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, where we're talking about the in verse 19, the cares of this world. The next one is the deceitfulness of riches. Deceitfulness of riches. God wants you to have the riches of Christ, but he doesn't want you to be having the deceitfulness of riches. What's the problem here? It's an attitude of heart. He wants to bless you financially, remember. But at the same time, he talks about, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. It's where your trust is. You can't be trusting in money, riches, things, possessions. That's a mistake. Also, you have to watch and make sure you don't let the love of money get a hold of you. Money is necessary. Nothing wrong with having it. God wants you to have lots of money. Just don't have the love of money. Don't be one who's, if I just get money, I'll be happy, you know, kind of attitude. No. The love of money is the root of all evil, while some coveted after it's because they're covetous. See, I want, I want, I want. They're greedy for more. What does God do? He wants to prosper the work of your hands, and he will. And you want God to you know, prosper you, and he will as you do what he says and follow. He'll even give you witty inventions and bring tremendous blessings for the purpose of what he wants. He, he can use you for financial ministry and doing all kinds of things. Don't ever let yourself get the love of money attitude and coveting after things. In fact, the guys that are covetous, they don't enter the kingdom of God. They're in trouble. That becomes idolatry in your life. You can't allow that. The deceitfulness of riches has to be overcome. Another one that we see back in Mark. Is the lust of other things entering in. Lust means the strong desires for something that's forbidden or something that's not right. Something that's not something you should be having. And that could be any of the lusts of the flesh. Because you're not supposed to have operating according to the flesh. The lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Notice about all these. The cares of this world, if you just have them coming at you, that doesn't mean you, that they've been successful. It's whether they enter in. The deceitfulness of riches, those attacks can come against you, but it has to enter in. You have to give place to it and accept it and start acting upon it. Same with the lust of other things. The devil will work through the flesh, of course, which has sin dwelling in it, 
to try to get you to yield to lust of the flesh. James 1.14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. What lust? The lust of the flesh. And he's enticed. He's been caught, essentially, because he's given place to it. When the lust has conceived, it seized him and take control of him. It's a word, form of the word lombano, if you see below. That's what it means when it's conceived. It's gotten you. It took you. You gave place to it. It got a hold of you now because you acted on it in some manner. Even if I plan to act upon it in my mind, it's gotten a hold of you. It bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Remember, sin is deceitful and it slays you. That's why we've got to guard ourselves from all areas of sin. And you can't allow any of the lusts of the flesh to get a hold of you because, remember, you're to walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need to walk in the Spirit, which is what? Walk in the Word of God, spiritual law, according to the Word. The flesh is lusting against the Spirit, the spirit against the flesh. The word spirit, by the way, it's not capitalized in the Greek. There's no capital letters. It should just be S, small s. It's talking about your spirit against your flesh, your body. These are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. Otherwise, the things you want to do, you're not doing. Why? Because of the attacks that are coming against you. This is why the key is getting yourself mind renewed, walking in line with the word, doing the word, and what are you doing when you do it? You're actually putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're becoming like him, which is what we are to become. Romans 13, 14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put ye on is the word enduo, which means to clothe yourself. Same way about putting on the armor of God or putting on, you know, different, uh, the new man in Christ. It's clothing yourself. This is a command to every one of us. This is a middle voice, meaning you do it for your benefit. You're responsible to see this get done. You clothe yourself and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Through the word in you. Hearing and doing the word, you're becoming like him. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And this is the key. The word provision means forethought. I mean, before you act upon it, the thought will come. Before you entertain it, the thought will be there. When the forethought comes, it comes into you, you got to deal with that right away. If you don't deal with it, it'll start working at you and trying to get you to yield to the flesh to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, which causes you to sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. It brings destruction against you. We must guard ourselves so we don't give place to the enemy. We go back to Mark 4. Important thing that we got to address here. Verse 19. If you let these things enter in, what does it do? It chokes the word. Otherwise, it's been working apparently, but now it gets choked out. It choked out the growth of it. In other words, you can have the word in you, you're hearing and doing it and everything's going along fine and all of a sudden mm, you, let, you, you gave place to a lust of the flesh and just knock that thing off. Your plant that was growing and, you know, start, starting to bring source, forth some fruit and things, now all of a sudden it gets cut down because you gave place to the enemy. It choked out the word. And it, the word, becomes unfruitful, as it says. We've got to look over in Matthew's account, though. It says one little thing a little bit differently. Matthew 13, 22. He that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word, care of this world, the seed most of riches, choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. You are only as fruitful as the word is. He becomes unfruitful, it or the word becomes unfruitful. The key is you must have the word in you and if you don't have the word producing fruit, you are unfruitful. You have no fruit in your life. Because remember, what produces the fruit? It's the word of God in you. Now, we come to, we've seen all these negative 
things that the devil brings against us. He comes to try to stop us from getting, doing the Word so we get spiritual understanding. He comes to try to get not us to have a reception to the Word and to take hold of the Word, you know, and just let the Word do whatever, you know, not act upon it in some way. If he can do that, he's successful. If he doesn't get you to, if you don't do the Word consistently and you never get the root system established, the foundation, he'll be successful. If he can come bring his affliction, pressure against you, or persecution, or tempt you in some way and get you to stand away and throw in the towel or give up or whatever, draw back, he's been successful. Yet those are all way, the ways he gets the word out. If he calls you to fall and stumble, he gets the word out by you sinning. If he gets the cares, the worries, the anxieties, if he gets the deceitfulness of riches or the lust of other things to enter in and choke it out, ah, you have no fruit either. No fruit. It's all cut down. It's all eliminated. So, we've got to get the fruit coming forth. God wants the fruitfulness, and these are the things that are necessary, we see, because the fourth type is the good ground. Mark 4, verse 20. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive. This is paradecomai, meaning they took a ready reception near themselves, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some hundred. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. That's what that's talking about. We see over in Matthew's account, it says a little bit differently. Verse 23. He that receives seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, meaning he's been walking in it and gained the spiritual understanding continually, also bears fruit, bringing forth some 100, some 60, 60, and some 30. Then we look over at Luke's account. Luke chapter 8, over in verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Now that's important. We have to have an honest and a good heart. Having heard the word, keep it or retain it and hold on to it and bring forth fruit with patience, hupomone, steadfastness. Now when it talks about the honest, this is the word kalos, meaning excellent or beautiful, something that's excellent. The good means something that is good and productive, essentially. So kalos refers to having an excellent attitude of heart, that be towards God, towards man, you don't have any sin operating in you. You've dealt with it successfully. The good heart, this is one that's a heart that is ready to take hold of things, useful, this word implies. So this is a good and beneficial heart that is ready to take hold of the word and of the promises and doing what the word says. So you've got to have a right heart towards God and man. No sin, you're doing the word and a right heart ready to take hold of all the things that God has for you. Because when you hear the word, you're to keep it, you're to retain it, you're to hold fast to it. He wants us to hold fast to it. This is all critical if you're going to see victory. And bring forth patience. Now when it talks about holding fast with the word, we are told to hold fast to things that are right. That means you can't let things go. You can't let the devil get to you and get you to try to turn right or turn left or go backwards or try something else or whatever. Prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Hold fast, same word, kateko, retain, hold on to, that which is good. Over in Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 6. Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. You hold fast your confidence in the Word, in God's work, and this hope, the confident expectancy, firm unto the end, to see the end result. Same thing is somewhat said over here in verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast, kateko, the beginning of our confidence, steadfast. This means firm, stable. That means you got the foundation laid. You're not wavering. You're not tossed to and fro. You're not up one minute and down the next minute, doubt, unbelief, or you know, whatever all. You're set. You're fast. You're firm. You're, you're, you're stable. He wants some spiritual stability in your life. 
Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast, kateko, the profession of our, remember this word faith means hope. It's the word el peace. You haven't heard us talk about this. El peace is, means hope. 53 times it's been translated hope correctly. Out of the 54 uses, one time erroneously faith, and this is where it's at. As Young's brings it out, the hope. The confession of our hope without wavering. Meaning, how can I hold fast and retain something? I can't be wavering. Why would you be wavering? You obviously don't have it set in you about the promise and about what will God, God will do, and you're acting upon it, the fact that he'll bring it to pass. And another key is you got to have confidence in him. He's faithful that promised. You've got to know God's a faithful God who will perform his word. He'll bring forth the healing. He'll bring forth the deliverance. He'll bring forth the victory. You just keep doing what the word says. You keep casting out. You keep speaking the promises into being. You keep doing what the Word says. You don't draw back. You're going to keep doing it as long as it takes until you see the enemies defeated, the victory come forth, the promise come into manifestation. Now, the other thing it talked about was that steadfastness. Luke chapter 21. Remember, you bring forth fruit with patience, which was steadfastness, hupomone. Luke 21, 19, in your patience, hupomone, steadfastness, possess ye your souls. Where is the battleground? In your soul. Mind, will, emotions. You must be steadfast so your emotions don't get to you, or your thoughts don't get to you, or your will quits, quits, you know, draws back, not going to do it anymore, blah, blah, blah. Try something else. The devil will try every trick. He knows every trick in the book, and he'll try everything. He knows all your weak points. He'll, he'll do everything possible to try to get to you, any way to get the word out of you, any way to choke the word out, any way to get you off track. It's all a battle over the word because the word is the power of God that produces the fruitfulness and the promise and brings the blessing that God performs in your life. The battle is over the word. This is why you've got to be ready. James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall or are encompassed about, fall is to be encompassed about, by these diverse temptations. What's going on? The devil's attacking the word, trying to stop you from seeing your faith bring forth victory as the word's been sown in your heart. Knowing this, the trying of your faith. Ah, the enemy's after it. What's it got to do? Remember where we got to have? We got to have steadfastness. It works or accomplishes, brings into being, brings about, which is really a good way to see what it really means in this case, brings about steadfastness. Now, if you're not steadfast in your soul, it's not going to be able to bring it about. How am I going to be steadfast in my soul? Because I got the word established in me. I've been a hearer and a doer of the word consistently. I got the foundation laid. I'm firm. I'm set fast. I'm stable. Nothing moves me. I know the truth. I'm a doer of it. It's happening. And I'm continuing. And God's bringing forth the victory. He's faithful that promised. I'm retaining it. I'm holding fast. Nothing is causing me to get off track. That is where you come to. That is steadfastness. And that is what he wants in your life. And of course, oh, of course we've already seen, we've got to be a doer of the word. If you're not a doer of the word, are you going to see victory? No, you won't. We know from James. We're talking about a consistent doer of the word, not someone who did it once or did it for a while. I don't care how long you've done it. Today's a new day. Do it today. Tomorrow's another day. Do it tomorrow. Do it every day. You keep doing it and doing it and speaking it and praying it and casting out and tacking and casting down and resisting and whatever it might be or praying the word, you keep doing it. Become, literally, continually, not just do it for a moment or for a certain time until I throw in the towel. The devil will push you to your, he know, he'll try to push you to your limit so you'll give up. You've got to get yourself set. There is no giving up. There is no deviating from what the word says. There's no change from doing the word consistently. I'm doing it, and that's it, continually. That's it. 
Nothing's going to make me move off of it. I'm not going to be moved by anything. Become doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. That shows you something. If the devil can get you not to do the word, you deceive your own self. Hey, you didn't have to do too much more to work at you because you didn't do the word. You can get the word right out. Well, I heard it. It should be working in me. You got to do it. Well, I heard the word says if I cast out, I'll get free. You got to do it. Well, I heard the word says if, if I cast out all these demons, I'll get free. Well, I cast out some, but you didn't cast all of them out yet, obviously, because they're not all gone. So what do you do? Continue to cast them out. If I'll speak the word and I'll command that mountain to be removed continually, it'll be removed. Well, I've been commanding. Well, keep doing it until it's gone. Keep taking hold of the promise. Keep speaking the word. Keep doing what he says. Keep sowing. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap in due season. If you faint not, the devil tries to get you to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, which is throw in the towel. Try something else. Give up. Don't make that mistake. If you're a hearer of the word, not a doer, you're like this. A man beholding his natural face in a glass, he beholds himself, goes his way, and forgets what manner of man he was. He forgets what he was. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's the word, and continues there, and he's doing it. That's it, all the time. He's not a forgetful hearer, but he's a doer of the work. He's working out his salvation. What work? He's working out his salvation by working the word. He's also doing the work of what? Working his faith, because you work it by doing it. This man will be blessed in his what? In his doing, literally it means. You'll be blessed in your doing. You're continually doing and performing what God's word says. That is what God wants. If you're going to see victory, you're going to hear the word continually. You're going to do the word continually. You're going to gain spiritual understanding you're going to always have a ready reception for what's offered to you and taking hold of it to apply it in your life and put it in operation. You're going to be holding fast and keeping, retaining that which you have and keep on acting on it, speaking it, professing it, confessing it, acting on the Word. You're going to always maintain a right heart attitude towards God and man. You can't let sin get to you or else you're in trouble. And you're going to have a good beneficial heart attitude taking hold of the promise with your faith, no doubt, no wavering, no turning right, no turning left, no drawing back, no, maybe, maybe it will work, maybe it won't. No. You're stable and set. You also conquer the affliction, persecution, temptation, cares, deceitful riches, loss of other things, anything that the devil brings against you, you conquer every single one. You're steadfast in the midst of whatever happens. Nothing moves you. You're steadfast in the soul, and you are a consistent doer, and you're going to be blessed in your doing. If you do this, you will see fruitfulness come forth in your life. One other thing, Mark chapter 4, verse 26, the kingdom of God operates the same way. So is the kingdom of God if a man should cast seed into the ground. Sleep and rise, night and day, the seed should spring up and grow. He knoweth not how. It's working in the realm of the Spirit, but he doesn't know how. I'm casting out. It's working in the realm of the Spirit, but I may not understand all that needs to be done. I'm praying the Word of God and speaking these promises into being. I may not see all the things that need to be done in the Spirit. All I know is it's working. You're operating in the Spirit. I'm interceding for so-and-so to get saved, and I'm doing all the things, and I am keep sowing the word of them and all these things. It's working, but I'm not sure how all it's working, but I know one thing, it's working. And it is working. And you will see that person come in due time. Of course, people can be resistant as well, you know. Earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. It's always a process, isn't it? You just didn't wake up and well, I got my tree and all my fruit next morning. I planted it yesterday. <laughs> no. The world, natural things that God has set, shows us it's all a process. It's a growth, it's a process. Fruitfulness is a process. When the fruit's brought forth, immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The fruit will be there in due season if you faint not. We've got to make sure that we are doing what he says. God wants fruitfulness. It's all because of the word in you.
Say this. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the parable of the sower. I understand the subject is the Word of God and how it produces fruit. And also it reveals the devil's attacks against the Word to try to stop the Word from producing fruit in my life. I will do what's necessary to see fruitfulness come forth in my life. I will hear the Word continually. I will do what I hear is I have a ready reception for it and I'm taking hold of it to apply it in my life. As I do it, I gain spiritual understanding and I will continue in it. I will hold fast and retain the Word, speaking the Word, doing the Word continually. I will maintain a right attitude of heart towards God and towards man. No sin or I would give place to the enemy. I will have a good and beneficial, receptive attitude of heart, taking hold of the promises, no doubt, no wavering, nothing coming into my heart that's going to deceive me or get me off track. I maintain a heart that believes and is taking hold of the promise. I will conquer all pressure all persecution, every temptation of the flesh, the lusts, or wherever it comes from, cares of this world, cares or anxieties, worries, concerns, deceitfulness of riches, any lusts of other things, I will conquer them all. And I will have my mind ready to conquer the attacks of the enemy against me. I will be steadfast to possess control of the soul. I will be a doer of the word consistently and I will see as the good ground. I will see fruit, more fruit, and much fruit coming forth in my life. I thank you, Lord. Thirty, sixty, hundredfold increase will continually come as I am a doer of this word. Thank you. That as I do the word, the spiritual fruit and the fruitfulness will come forth in my life. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tonight we have more to talk about on the subject of spiritual fruitfulness as well. Father, we thank you for this word that is so important, the parable of the sower is so important. If we don't understand this parable, how can we understand any of them, the word says. Thank you for the revelation of this. Thank you that we're going to be doers of it, and we're going to see the fruitfulness come forth in every one of our lives. We thank you for accomplishing it in Jesus' name. Amen.